A few weeks ago, Illinois' leading political columnist, the Chicago Sun-Times, Steve Neal, mentioned that Senator John Edwards of North Carolina, quote, may well be the Democratic Party's best hope, unquote, for President of the United States four years hence. Well, maybe. With all due respect to Illinois' leading political columnist, not all the precincts have been heard from. <laughs> Since the nominations are not yet closed, I want to submit the name of our senior senator from Illinois for consideration as the vice presidential nominee four years hence and or the presidential nominee four years later. If there is any doubt as to exactly what I am saying, I am referring, of course, to our guest today. Like you, I have been watching him very carefully these past few years, and he just does not make any political mistakes. More important, he has been in the forefront on the right side of three or four really powerful issues. Tobacco, gun safety, and education, for starters. Our guest today has played his cards brilliantly. He is now the first Illinois senator in more than 25 years to serve on one of the most powerful and elite committees in the United States Senate, the Appropriations Committee. That places him in a pivotal position to play a very active role in shaping the budget of President Bush. If that is not enough action, soon there will be pitched battles for seats on the United States Supreme Court. Earlier this year, the Senator maneuvered himself onto the Senate Judiciary Committee, where he will have a very powerful voice and role in the confirmation proceedings of new justices to the United States Supreme Court. In all likelihood, that means he will question, speak on, and vote on at least two, perhaps three, new justices, including the possibility of a new chief justice. These two major newspaper newsmaker roles will elevate our guest today to the role of a national player. Interestingly, when we were preparing this introduction, we thought our guest's growing national prominence would soon lead to exposure on the Sunday morning talk shows. And bingo. A week ago last Sunday, who shows up on Meet the Press but our very own senator, and he did a yeoman job. Our guest today is a proven vote getter. As a multi-term congressman, he was elected and re-elected over and over again from a comfortably Republican district in central Illinois. He is on a very fast track. Ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to welcome to the City Club of Chicago, United States Senator Dick Durbin. Dick.
Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thanks. Very nice. Thank you. Well, Jay, the truth can now be told. I accepted that invitation on Meet the Press as a warm-up for the City Club of Chicago. <laughs> what a nice introduction. I thank you very much for inviting me. There are so many friends and uh, colleagues here in the audience. I, I wouldn't dare get started acknowledging them because I'm sure to miss uh, some who are very, very important. But I will tell you that um, I've known the City Club of Chicago since my earliest days working for Paul Simon down in Springfield when he was lieutenant governor. And I know that this organization has always been one of the most important uh, forums in our state uh, for pronouncements about issues that are of importance to this city and as well as the region and even to the nation. Uh, I'd like to speak to you today about uh, the city of Chicago, but the Chicagoland area and the state. Uh, I can recall, he's not here, but he may arrive when former Congressman Dan Rostkowski decided one day to come up to me as I was a brand new congressman leaning on the rail in, Spr in uh, Washington. And he said, Durbin, he said, uh, you're from Springfield? I said, yes. I'd made quite an impression. He <laughs> said, uh, so you had a pretty close race there, didn't you? Oh, that's true. I won by 1,200 votes. Uh, do you plan on sticking around here? Well, I'd like to. And he said, I mean, seriously, you're not going to leave if you get a park district job or something, are you? I said, no. <laughs> so I plan, plan to get it. Well, he says, if you're really serious about sticking around here, he says, I'd like to put you on an important committee. I'd like to put you on the House Appropriations Committee. He says, but I'm not going to waste my time. This is, he was pretty candid. I'm not going to waste my time on you if you're going to turn around and lose the next election. So he says, I'll watch and see what you do. So um, I went back to Springfield and faced a tough re-election campaign, but got 60% of the vote, I think it was, somewhere like that. And I called him election night. And I said, Mr. Chairman, I got 60% of the vote. He said, fine, and I'll back you for the Appropriations Committee. So we went to work on what we call our Steering Policy Committee with uh, then Congressman Marty Russo. And after all the dust had settled, I ended up being uh, appointed to the Appropriations Committee by one vote, one vote. And so I went to his office afterwards when I got the great news, and uh, I asked to meet with him. And Virginia let me in, which is quite a breakthrough in those days. <laughs> and uh, so I went in and I sat down, and he had his typical scowl on his face. He was looking at me as I sat there, like I'd just done something that he was very displeased with. And I said, Mr. Chairman, I don't want to take any of your time, but I just want to thank you so much for this appointment to the Appropriations Committee, and I, I hope that I can do a good job for you. I want you to remember one thing, he said. I said, what's that? He said, Chicago. I said, thank you very much, Mr. <laughs> Chairman. <laughs> that was his only instruction, and I followed it very carefully for the next 12 years. Let's talk about this city. 130 years ago this year, on October 7th, the Great Fire of Chicago really created a biblical test for the people who lived here. And from the ruins emerged what Donald Miller called the city of the century. Today, Chicago argu arguably is the nation's leader again with a hum of activity that you can see and feel everywhere. New construction, reform of the public school system, reform of public housing, developments in this city that other cities look on with great wonderment. If you've visited Cleveland or Detroit or St. Louis or Minneapolis lately, you know what I'm talking about. They're doing okay, but not like Chicago. This city's cooking. And there are a lot of reasons for it. Great credit goes to a mayor, a man whom I served as uh, a staff attorney to when he was a state senator down in Springfield over 20 years ago. This mayor combines street-level common sense with an unparalleled vision and determination, and it shows. He knows how to make Chicago work. But the challenge for those of us with the public responsibility to lead in this state and this city is not to glory in the success of Chicago, but to look ahead at the problems we will face tomorrow. I could have spoken today about a number of topics that really fit right in to this introduction. Some of them will come up in the questions and answers. One of them is transportation. Every other question from a reporter in, in this area is about an airport. Uh, it is the third rail of Illinois politics. But we have to face it, and I'm sure we will uh, in the time ahead. The question about highway congestion. 
Everyone who lives in this region knows that on the 8s and on the 10s, they'll find out when they're going to get home tonight. Uh, and that's part of life in the Chicagoland area. Some other problems are not quite as obvious in transportation, but meetings I've held in the last couple of weeks about railroad congestion, and I'm talking about rail road congestion freight trains that many times have to offload their cargo on one end of Chicago by truck and take it to the other side of Chicago because it takes so long to go through Chicago and all the problems that happen when the trains go through. I could have addressed the issues of uh, crime, an issue which uh, has come to the forefront as we have uh, really focused on racial profiling as well as effective ways to fight crime in the communities. The future of our exchanges, which have meant so much to the city's economy and are changing so rapidly. Our state and region's role in the information technology revolution. Energy issues. As you can see, I had a lot of things to choose from. But the issue I want to talk to, or speak to, and what I'd like to talk to you about, is an issue that is as American as it gets. It's an issue about new neighbors and new people. Immigration to the United States represents the largest population movement in recorded history. Since the American Revolution, more than 50 million immigrants have come to our shores. In our first census in 1790, when my father's family was around, our nation was 50% English, 20% African, 15% Scotch and Irish, and 7% German. But the push and pull of life would change these ethnic groups as America grew in size and diversity. Famine, religious persecution, and political change pushed boatloads of immigrants to our shores. The Homestead Act, the Transcontinental Railroad, and the promise of economic prosperity pulled the ambitious and the desperate to America. The Irish came to the Chicago in the 1830s to dig the Illinois and Michigan Canal. Their shanty town where the canal met the southern branch of the Chicago River was a place called Bridgeport. By the 1850s, the Irish were a power in the Democratic Party in this city. By 1865, a third of the Chicago policemen were Irish. By 1900, they had six times as many Irishmen on the Chicago police force as the next closest ethnic group. Ethnic group. The Catholic Church was the focal point of their neighborhoods and their lives. Between 1884 and 1915, only one Chicago bishop was not Irish. They created a network of neighborhoods and parishes, immigrant aid societies, Hibernian clubs, and ward organizations to protect their own and to project their influence. Between the 1880s and World War I, the American quilt grew with a wave of new immigrants from South and Eastern Europe, Italy, Russia, Poland, and Jews from across Europe. In that 30-year period from 1880 to World War I, 25 million new Americans arrived, an immigration wave that peaked in 1911. Lucky for me, that was the year that two-year-old Ona Kutkaita from Lithuania was carried to our shores by my grandmother. So my mother's side of the family arrived. Fast forward to the 21st century, and you'll find that the magnetic pole of America is just as strong as ever. But the newcomers are now predominantly Hispanic. Between 1820 and 1975, Mexican immigration represented 4.1% of the total. By the late 70s, that number had quadrupled. You probably looked at the census statistics in the Tribune and the Sun-Times recently to see the changes that are taking place here. And for someone who's followed the political scene for a number of years, as I'm sure many of you have, it's just amazing to go through the list of towns and to see the changes that are taking place. I looked at the towns where 40 to 50 percent of the population was now, quote, minority population, largely Hispanic. Addison, Bensonville, Carpentersville, Elgin, Aurora, Harvard, Waukegan. The numbers tell the story. There are now more than 35 million Americans of Hispanic origin living in the United States, about 13 percent of our country's total population. They're now tied with African Americans as the largest minority group. If the population trends continue, they'll be the new majority minority group soon. In 1995, there were about 1 million Latinos living in Illinois. Based on the rate of population growth, the Census Bureau estimated that that would grow to 1.2 million by the year 2000. But now there are 1.5 million Latinos living in Illinois. The state and the country's Latino population is growing faster and faster. 
60% increase in Latino population nationwide in the last 10 years, 69% increase in the state of Illinois. Recently, I went to Wheeling and visited a clinic, met with Dr. Jesse Rodriguez. It's a clinic that is uh, co-sponsored by the Cook County Hospital and Northwest Hospital. It mainly serves uninsured Hispanics and their families. I walked in and Dr. Rodriguez spoke to me for a few minutes and he said, I want you to take away one message, Senator. And I said, what's that? They're not going home. This is home. And I think it's an important lesson to be learned as we consider the impact of this new population in our midst. Take a look at the issue of education. If there's such a dramatic growth in the Hispanic population, how are they doing in school? Well, the dropout rate for white students in America is about 7%. The dropout route rate for African American students is about 13%. The dropout rate nationally for Hispanic students is about 30%. In our state, the Hispanics comprise about 11.7% of high school students, but more than double that number drop out of high school. 6% dropout statewide in Illinois, but among the Hispanic populations, 23 to 24%. There are a lot of reasons for these dropout rates. High concentrations of poverty, limited numbers of Hispanic role models and teachers, insufficient family and community support, and a lot of other pressing priorities. Things are being done about it. On the state level, Jim Palos is here with Project Impact. Governor Ryan has really started focusing on high schools in the city of Chicago and around the state. It's just beginning, Jim, but it's an important project because it really, I think, goes after the issue where we should go, right in public education. Mark Druhan is in the back of the room. Would you raise your hand, Mark? Mark uh, heads up a group called HiSight. This is an amazing program that I visited one Saturday morning just a few blocks from here where they tutor kids from high schools around the area to get them into college. It's an amazing mentoring program which has a great record of success with Hispanic and African American students. What do we need to do? Well, we need more programs like these. Mentoring programs and programs that focus on the new Americans, the new Hispanic population, and other populations that are struggling to be part of this great America. We need to rebuild our schools. The mayor believes, and I do too, that if we're in time of surplus, we need to invest and in to make sure that our schools not only are great buildings with the best technology, but also have the greatest teachers. You just can't beat a good teacher. But if you don't have one, you can fall behind very quickly. We need to reduce class size. We need to address the digital divide, teacher pay and training, all of these things. The last debate we had just a few weeks ago in, in Washington over the president's uh, proposed tax cut, the president did pretty well until it came to one amendment, an amendment offered by Tom Harkin of Iowa. The amendment suggested a substantial cut from the president's tax cut and that the money be invested in two things, paying off the national debt and investing $250 billion over the next 10 years, new spending on education. A bipartisan majority came together in the Senate and passed that amendment. I certainly hope that it holds when we get back and start uh, contemplating the conference that's ahead of us. Dr. Rodriguez, uh, that, when I talked about him earlier uh, and his admonition to me to remember that these are our neighbors and friends who are going to be here, well, that wasn't the first thing he told me. The first thing he said as I walked in the door, he said, good to meet you, Senator. We need universal health care. First words out of his mouth. And there's a reason for it, for him making the statement and for all of us to be thinking about it. In 1990, 34.4 million Americans had no health insurance. Today, more than 43 million are uninsured. That number grows relentlessly by a million or more each year. South Africa is about to create its own national health care system, and once it does, we'll be the last industrialized country in the world without a national health insurance system. And we pay for it. The uninsured don't get the preventive care that they need. I'm sure Dr. Magoon can tell you from our children's hospital, all the hospitals in the area, that the people show up acutely ill who might have been treated earlier for a modest amount of money, and those people, of course, when they receive the services, have those services paid by others. Hospitals serving the uninsured struggle financially. The same hospitals who serve a large number of uninsured also serve the poor who have insurance through the Medicaid program. 
Here in Chicago, the 27 hospitals who serve the most Medicaid and uninsured patients provide more charity care than 50 suburban Chicago hospitals. Nationwide, the amount of charity care provided by hospitals has risen from $12.1 billion in 1990 to $20.7 billion in 1999. Last year, we faced a crisis in funding on Medicaid for our state. We were about to lose $500 million. We came together as a delegation, Speaker Hastert, myself, and others, and we managed to save that money for our hospitals. I'm not sure what would have happened at Cook County Hospital without that Medicaid assistance, or St. Bernard's, or so many others that are just hanging by a thread, serving the poorest populations, black, Hispanic, and others. And if we look at the needs of the new immigrants to this country and the Hispanic populations, we understand that there are things we can do. 1997, we enacted the Kennedy Hatch Children's Health Insurance Program. This program is designed to ensure half the children in America who've previously been uninsured. Already, three million children who were previously uninsured have been enrolled in this new program. Here in Illinois, as of April 1st this year, 147,869 children now receive health insurance through the Illinois Kid Care Program. We're reaching out to these kids to make sure they have coverage, but we shouldn't stop there. I'm glad to report to you that there's a bill pending in uh, Springfield that expands this children's program to provide Medicaid coverage to the parents as well. State Representative Sarah Feigenholtz is the sponsor in the House and State Senator Lisa Madigan, the sponsor in the Senate. If the bill passes, it could provide benefits to as many as 200,000 working parents of poor children. I hope that it does, and I hope if you like the idea that you'll contact your state, rep state senator and tell them that it's important. How does it relate to the Hispanic immigration? Well, I can tell you one of the things that we're concerned about is not just the dropout rate among Hispanics, but also the teen pregnancy rate among Latinas. It's not clear as to whether Hispanic girls are dropping out of school at high rates because they become pregnant or whether their dropping out of schools increases the likelihood of their pregnancy. It is clear that Hispanic girls having dropped out of school and become pregnant are far less likely to return to school than other groups. This may be partially explained by a cultural emphasis on women as mothers and homemakers that's prevalent in Latin America, where women often marry and start a family much younger than the United States. We've seen some progress in statistics on teen pregnancy across our nation. In the last uh, few years, between 1991 and 1998, white teen pregnancy went down 22 percent. Hispanic went down 2 percent. African American decreased 22 percent. So the problems are going to grow unless we address them and address them directly. The last point I'd like to make here is about housing. I mentioned earlier about the construction going on in this city. And you can't help but be impressed by it as more and more areas are uh, seeing the condos and the lofts and the gentrification, the new construction. But you also know at the same time that the cost of real estate has gone up substantially. For the poorest of the poor, there is some public housing, not nearly enough. For those with enough resources, they can play in this real estate market. But how about the folks in between? The Chicago housing market is extraordinarily tight. The availability of affordable, quality rental housing is fundamental to the stability of families and neighborhoods throughout Chicago. The Chicago housing market is tight for anyone earning less than $30,000 a year. More than 300,000 entry-level employees are commuting long distances to work because they can't find housing near their job. HUD says that the market is tight if the vacancy rate is 6%. The regional Chicago market has a vacancy rate of 4.2%. Chicago has had a net loss of more than 46,000 rental units between 1990 and 1998, even as the region added 312,000 new jobs. And, of course, it's expensive. Almost 40% of renters in metropolitan Chicago pay more than 30% of their income on rent. And that's still the standard of affordability in housing. Rent increases have far exceeded inflation rates in the last 10 years. So the people that waited on your tables today have to find a place to live. And if they're looking for a place anywhere near here, it's awfully expensive. Let me conclude by saying that I haven't given up hope in the housing area. I recently visited a project uh, in Pilsen, the Resurrection Project. Uh, if any of you have uh, come across this, it's an extraordinary uh, <coughs> undertaking. Father Chuck Dom and uh, Ramon Ramundo, who is involved in it, have really built a hundred of the nicest little homes you could ask for in the Pilsen area for families that otherwise would never have had a chance 
for home ownership. They brought together a number of Catholic parishes and they're really pointing the way. It's great, but it's 120 houses in an area where thousands are needed. Here's the challenge we face. The new Americans of our time come to our nation with the same determination and hope as our ancestors. The problems they face are not unlike those faced by immigrant groups earlier in our history. We can see that their chances to tap into America's public schools, which have been the most important institution for assimilation, are diminished. We know that their access to good health care and decent housing is limited. And we know in time that like virtually every other immigrant group, they will prevail and become full participants. But can we afford to wait for this social revolution and accept its cost to our nation and the Hispanic families that will pay the price? In this time of unprecedented prosperity, I hope that we'll have the political will to make our new Americans full partners in our state and nation. Thank you. Uh, the senator will take some questions. Because we're on television, you'll have to get up to the microphone in the middle of the, uh, of the room there. And while you're figuring out which question to ask, uh, you know, the senator you know, got a lot of high praise so far today. Of course, I haven't had a chance to do much talking. But uh, uh, remember, the last, the last two people he beat were Billy Owens and Al Salvi. How many times have you been a candidate? <laughs> Twice, and I won by a lot less than you did with a lot less constituents. <laughs> Anyways, let's throw it up. I mean, those two guys are pretty heavy hitters. Uh, let's throw it up and for, uh... and Mr. Schoenberg, you should only hope that that could become one of your opponents. Uh, any, quest any questions? Step up to the mic. This is a very small D Democratic group. Watching the next, this person give us maybe a big D Democratic Marty group. Gleason. Marty, state your name. Uh, Marty Gleason. You got it right. Dick, uh, you know of my personal interest in matters uh, involving the Hague Treaty and Germany. President Clinton did some very good things in that area, and uh, I'm concerned uh, that this administration is either unaware or not willing to press hard against Germany to get them to recognize the return of uh, children to this country who've been abducted. Yes, I'm, and I, I, let's give them some time, Marty, because they're brand new, and I, I think that uh, they will come to understand the situation, and it happens all too often. 75% of the cases we deal with in our office deal with immigration in some form or another, and this relates to situations where children are abducted and taken to a foreign country, and we can't get the cooperation of that country in the return of the children. And I know this is something that touches you personally and a lot of families. And I think that uh, this administration should move, as a Clinton administration did, toward putting pressure on Germany and other countries to give these families fair treatment. Bill Wally, Chicago Multicultural Dance Center and the Bryant Ballet. You haven't addressed the arts and the, the list of issues that you had there, but National Endowment for the Arts is our federal resource. Now, when we plan to see it getting federal help, we've got a president who's not necessarily supportive of the NEA. His budget, as I understand it, doesn't propose cuts, but I would suspect that he wouldn't fight real hard when some of the congressional Republicans start to go after NEA. What do you think uh, is going to happen in that case, and what do you think about NEA's funding in the next two or three years? Two years ago, Senator Bob uh, Smith in New Hampshire got up on the floor with John Ashcroft and proposed eliminating federal funding for the National Endowment for the Arts. They gave about two hours of speeches, and I came to the floor and told the other side of the story, and then they tried to withdraw their amendment, and I wouldn't let them. I forced a roll call, and we won. And we had a substantial number of Republicans who support the position that uh, funding for the arts and humanities is important for this country. I think that uh, they'll do well in Congress, not as well as I'd like to see them do, but I think they're going to survive their critics. Thank you. Senator Joel Cohen, CEO, Richard Hoffman Corporation. Uh, Jay brought up a point about your possible run in uh, 2004. We always take seriously what Jay suggests. So, um, my my question. They're hoping to get introduced. Uh, my um, my question is, um, given what happened in this last election, which many of us are still in shock over, and you know some believe that the current president really won by one vote. 
what is being done to correct, oh, I just got a knife in my back. Yeah, <laughs> that's okay. Um, what is being done to correct that situation, particularly in Florida or in some other states where it looked like there were probably some voting right violations? Well, it's ironic. I'm going to leave here to say hello to former Vice President Gore, who's visiting Chicago. I haven't seen him since the election. Uh, I was invited with the other senators to attend the inauguration of the new president, and I, of course, accepted the invitation uh, because of the historic nature of the occasion. It was a kind of a wet and a dismal day in many respects. And we stood at, and sat out there in, in the weather, and I sat next to a Republican senator who said to me, did you hear about uh, President-elect Bush's inauguration address? I said, no. I said, well, it's very short. It's 10 minutes long. I said, well, I like that. And he said, he also has a point in there I think you'll appreciate where he says, and I want to thank all those who made my election possible, my voters, Justice Rehnquist, Justice Scalia, yeah. Justice O'Connor. Um, it was an election which will be uh, talked about and analyzed for years and years to come. But what can we do about it? We have to accept the reality that thousands, hundreds of thousands of Americans went to the polling place, did their civic duty, and their ballots weren't counted. Over 120,000 here in Cook County had some irregularity or problem with their ballot and some question as to whether it was counted. That error rate is dramatically larger in our cities around the country than it is in other areas. What does it reflect? It reflects old voting equipment. The city of New York uses voting machines that aren't manufactured anymore. We use a punch card system which was the rage in the 1960s and still is around and doesn't work all that well. We also have to accept the reality that 24 million Americans are illiterate. Many of them have limited literacy skills, and they're coming into a high-pressure situation with a line of people waiting for them to understand the instructions and do their duty. And I think if we don't accept the reality that this challenge places, we ignore what happened in the 1960s. We took great pride in the 1960s in civil rights and said, finally, voting is available for everybody. Black, white, or brown, no literacy test, no poll tax, you're going to get a chance to vote. And we're proud of that as Americans. Well, we put it in the law, but we didn't put it in fact until we've translated our voting system into something that's understandable, comprehensible, that the average person can vote and feel confident that they've really exercised their right. There are vote there's voting equipment made that's used around the world that is uh, amazing. In South America, voting equipment made in the United States gives you a screen that looks like your ATM machine. And you look there and you see the name of your candidate and the candidate's party and the symbol for the party. And when you punch on the appropriate place in the screen, up pops your candidate's picture to verify that's who you voted for. That's there. It exists. We're a long way from it. Many of us believe that if we're going to really pursue civil rights, we've got to invest in the voting uh, of, our, of our country. Elections could really change. Uh, the results could change just based on everyone's vote being counted. There are a lot of people angry about what happened last November, and I think we ought to channel that anger into something very positive. Yes. Joyce Saxon. Thank you. Um, Senator, I'm a Spanish interpreter, so I understand the problem a little better than some people. A lot of the people who have come here from down south, they are analfabetos. That means without the alphabet, they are illiterate in Spanish. So you've got to teach them Spanish before you can teach them English. What would happen if we close the borders for five years to catch up? Well, let me say on the first point, I, I went to speak at a neighborhood library, and I'm trying to remember the name. Was Luzano? Is there a uh, Luzano Library? And they asked me to read to the kids who were at the library. And I thought, now that ought to be the, the last thing in the world these kids want is some middle-aged politician reading a book. To my surprise, they thronged around me. There's a large group of kids, and the book was written in Spanish and in English. I don't speak Spanish. I barely get through the pronunciation of the words. And so I would turn to some of the Hispanic kids around me and say, can you read this part? And they said, no. And then I would say the words, and they'd say, no, that's not how it's pronounced. They are illiterate in the language, though they are conversant in the language because of their families. So that is, that is a serious challenge. And Frankly, if we can make certain that they end up first with proficiency in English, but second, preserving their language skills in Spanish, they're going to be better able to compete and be successful in their lives. Uh, closing the borders, uh, virtually impossible, physically impossible. Uh, as one of my aides, Mike Daly, used to say, if we can't stop them from smuggling narcotics in prison, how are we going to stop people from coming across a border? And that is about what we're faced with here. We do our best. 
uh, to try to slow down this wave of immigration, but there is a magnet here of not only democracy and freedom, but economic opportunity. And people are willing to risk a lot, and they are willing to try hard just to get to be part of this scene here in America, in this environment. We ought to enforce the laws, but I don't hold out great hope that it's going to stop the inflow. Jeff Berkowitz, uh, head of JB Consulting Group and also host of Public Affairs Cable Television Program. I mean, yeah, you, you just mentioned Justice Scalia, Justice Rehnquist, and so forth, and Jay Doherty mentioned that you may have the opportunity to vote on two or three nominations from President Bush, which we would assume might tend to be fairly conservative. I'm wondering, it's a two-part question, how conservative could somebody be in terms of their judicial philosophy, in terms of, for example, whether they were pro-life, whether they wish to construe the Constitution narrowly, strictly? How conservative could they be and still get your support, number one? And number two, if Justice Scalia were to come before your committee and he were nominated and you knew all of what you know now, about his qualifications, his views, and so forth, but he were nominated for justice of the U.S. Supreme Court, could you support somebody like Justice Scalia? Well, I'm not going to engage in hypotheticals, though everybody likes to ask those questions. I can tell you do a TV show. Uh, everybody likes to ask that, <laughs> that kind of a question. But let me just hearken back to the experience with John Ashcroft. We understood going in that John Ashcroft would not be defeated for Attorney General. But it was also important for us to make it clear that over 40 Democratic senators were willing to vote against him on the principle that we wanted more moderate nominees from the White House in important positions like attorney general, judicial uh, vacancies, and the like. Uh, and I think that was the message that went out. Uh, I don't know who the next nominee will be, but if the president sends a name that is very conservative and appears to be so far out of the mainstream that he, he or she would not address the basic issues and values that many of us think are important, I think there would be opposition in the Senate, substantial opposition. Uh, politicians come and go. Congressmen and senators and presidents come and go. Supreme Court justices hang around a long, long time. Justice Rehnquist was uh, named to the bench by President Nixon. He's still there. And others have been there for long periods of time. And many of us want to make certain that what uh, Mr. Ashcroft said was the settled law of the land on a lot of issues is respected. Uh, now, there are so many issues hanging in a 5-4 balance in the Supreme Court today that any vacancy and any uh, nomination and appointment could tip that balance. I don't think there have been higher stakes uh, at risk in uh, Supreme Court in, in modern memory. If you, if you read a history of the Supreme Court, a fellow by the name of Irons has written one called The People's History of the Supreme Court. Up until the time of FDR, the Supreme Court was just the uh, barricade that everything ran up against and stopped. That was, the, uh, they were the status quo. Nothing was going to change. With FDR and his battles and packing the court and all the rest, the change in the court took place. It became a more progressive institution. Uh, and now we're at a point in our history where we have to answer, what is it going to be for the next 10 or 20 years? Will some of the rights that we've assumed are really part of America be challenged and overturned? Hello. Sharon Matthews. I'm with the Safer Foundation. Uh, we provide access to education and employment for people who are ex-offenders as a way to reduce recidivism. And in your comments about the rise in population of Latinas in Chicago and throughout Illinois, unfortunately, that rise is also happening within the criminal justice system. And you mentioned uh, an educational bill that you're working on, $250 billion. And I was wondering if any of that is being earmarked uh, for individuals who are incarcerated as well as ex-offenders. And also, what are your feelings about the Pell Grant now being um, not available to those who are incarcerated uh, so that they can go on to four year uh, and complete. Many have completed uh, four years and gotten a de degree when they uh, were incarcerated. And this is proven that education and Absolutely. employment are the key to reducing recidivism. That was going to be my other city club speech. Uh, I will try to give, I'll try to give you the condensed version if I can. Please I think do. everyone is aware of the fact that the rates of incarceration in America, particularly among people of color, have gone up dramatically. Uh, for example, in 1987, in Illinois prisons, we had 500 inmates who were in prison for the possession of a thimble full of cocaine. 
1987, 500. Today we have 9,000. We also have uh, changed the rules when it comes to mental illness in courts, and according to the director of the Illinois Department of Corrections, fully a third of his inmates have serious mental problems and receive no assistance whatsoever. The average incarceration for a person for drug crime in Illinois is about a year. During the period of their incarceration, there is no drug rehabilitation. They come in addicts, they leave addicts, but they picked up some criminal skills and they met some new friends while they were in prison. So they go on out looking to renew their addiction and looking for a new victim to pay for the addiction. Does this make any sense to anybody in this room? And when you look at what you can do about this, you have to address the need for education. Most of the people who come to our prisons don't have basic literacy skills. If they can acquire those and develop some self-esteem and some confidence, they can really make a difference. I want to point out a fellow who's here in this room who was introduced earlier, and a fellow by the name of Al Friedman, who's sitting right down here. When there was a national war against midnight basketball, it was Al Friedman who called me and said, I support Midnight Basketball, and I support the men and women who are part of it, and I hire them as part of my operations and properties around this city. Al, you deserve praise for that, because it's been real courage on your part and foresight, and I think you've gotten some great employees out of that experience. Now, when it comes to racial profiling, everybody says they're against racial profiling. Well, I'm sure against it, too. But let me tell you, it goes beyond arrest and investigation. It goes beyond the troopers pulling the car over, because you happen to be black or brown. It goes to other questions. Why, if we have 12% of the population that is uh, African American and 13% of the population African American committing drug crimes, why 35% of those arrested for drug crimes are African American, 50% of those convicted are African American, and 65% of those, of those incarcerated are African American? If you want to take the racial profiling issue to its logical conclusion, we've got to ask about the entire justice system from one end to the other. And it apply, applies to Hispanics as well as African Americans. And if that statue of justice is truly going to have a blindfold and use it, then we've got to really challenge a system that really focuses so many resources on the poorest and impoverished and minority populations in this country. Thank you. Will Thank your you. bill do that in terms of education? This bill is a, a, it's like the blueprint, $250 billion without specificity. Then we get down to details. And uh, I think it's a good investment. I think giving those incarcerated the basic skills to survive once they're out is just, just makes good sense. And I support that. Thank you. I don't know how much time we have. Very good answer. I feel like Jim Wright at the 1988 Democratic Convention when Clinton was given, uh, uh, introducing uh, 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 Dukakis. Three more questions, short questions, and short answers. We have closure here, sir. <laughs> yes, ma'am. So we are. Hi, I'm Rita McLennan. I'm the executive director of the National Center on Poverty Law. And first, I want to thank you for your support of family care. It's very, very important to the people in the state. Um, my question is another Supreme Court question. Um, in addition to selecting our president, the Supreme Court created some sort of a constitutional crisis in terms of the balance of power between the three. Uh, main bodies. Um, my question is, do you see any possibility of putting a moratorium on selecting new Supreme Court justices until the next election? <laughs> uh, that's been suggested. I think it might have been John Galbraith who wrote that, but someone, someone did write an article after the election and said, because the popular vote went one way, the electoral vote another by one vote, then we really shouldn't make any permanent appointments to anything during this period of time. I don't think that's likely to happen. I think the president is going to use his prerogative to fill vacancies, and Congress will have to make its decisions. Um, I, th I think there is some uncertainty about uh, that election. There will be a lot of speculation, but I don't think it will slow the president down. Marty? Marty Castro, partner with Castro Gomez Durbin and DeJesus. Not that Durbin. What was that one that name? One over there. <laughs> uh, Senator, upstairs, tenants. <laughs> upstairs, <laughs> right. Uh, Senator, we don't have a Latino in the United States Senate. And we haven't had one for over a generation. Hopefully, we won't have to wait another generation. But until we do, I'm glad that you're there looking out for the interests of my community. It means a lot to us. And just the other day, you and I spoke about a specific case of a little girl an undocumented girl here in Chicago, fifth grader uh, from Mexico, who's in dire need of a liver transplant. Hospitals here won't help her because federally funded hospitals are prohibited from helping undocumented aliens receive organ transplants. You've been a leader on the issue of organ transplants, and your staff's already working on trying to help save this little girl's life in this instance. But from a broader public policy perspective, what is the likelihood that we might be able to do something in Congress, in the Senate, 
on changing this particular provision that prohibits individual undocumented because folks aren't coming to this country looking for organ transplants. They're looking to contribute and, and make a better life for themselves. Is there some hope that we might be able to help other little kids like this? We really should build in some hardship excep exceptions here. This, this little girl, if she returns to Mexico, Marty and I talked about this, for a, a, a liver transplant, and it's an extremely expensive and risky operation, and her family goes with her, any member of the family, they can't get back in the country. Uh, and so they're in a catch-22 situation. I had another case involving a young woman in town here who is Korean, and she came here at the age of one with her family. She is a music prodigy. She has been accepted at Juilliard to go on and study. And when she applied for a scholarship, she finally realized she was an undocumented alien. And the only recourse she has now is to go back to Korea. She can't qualify for a scholarship. She's lived her whole life here. You know, we've got to accept the reality here that at certain points people have made this home and have made a contribution and should be given a chance to become naturalized citizens. Uh, I know that uh, there are those who criticize that, but I just think uh, that if we have any heart in this country, and we do have a lot, that we should have sensitivity to those issues. Thanks, Senator. Thanks, Marty. To close. Yes, I'm Frank Frizenzi. I'm a real estate broker with Lakeview Realty, and I'm also chair of the 19th District Advisory Council. Uh, one of the things that's concerning, you know, people on the uh, council is some of the cutbacks, you know, for police and law enforcement. Uh, I'm specifically uh, worried about the more proactive uh, end of it that may be cut back, like for caps and that. Uh, one of the things that we'd like to at least think we have some effect on doing is maybe lowering the population in prisons and that by working with people before they go in. And uh, I think if, if you want to, you know, start getting a handle on the prison situation, you should start before they go in. Uh, once they're in, you have other problems, and those were brought up. The COPS program has been successful. Uh, President uh, Clinton tried to put 100,000 COPS on the beat across America, and uh, we have over 1,000 officers in Illinois as a result of that program. Uh, the President Bush's new budget that was uh, released last week cuts that program for the COPS uh, on the beat as well as COPS in school by 56 percent. Uh, it would have a $13 million impact on our state for municipalities and others that have brought in new police and now won't receive the help from the federal government as they have been promised. I don't think that makes any sense. I think this program has worked. Crime rates have gone down, not primarily because of the COPS program or uh, you can't really say this has really done it, but you have to acknowledge that having more presence of community policing has really helped to give people more confidence that they're safe in their neighborhoods. I also think that the cops in the school program, this isn't, is a good one. This isn't a program where the cop wanders the halls looking stern and mean. Uh, I've seen a lot of these police who have become part of the family at each school, where the kids come to know a policeman personally for the first time and get involved in activities and really feel uh, that, yes, they do have some responsibility as citizens. So I hope that we can restore those funds, and I think that we probably will. But the president waited to announce his budget till the day after we left Washington, and tomorrow's the first day we're back to comment on it. And, I'll bet the COPS program's at high on the list. Thanks, everybody. Oh.